Welcome, welcome, welcome back to another installment of Internet People Live. Once again, this is Zach Fox coming to you straight out of uh, L.A. this week. I'm back home. It's blazing hot. The climate crisis is at an all-time high. We're all on a bullet train straight to ecological hell. But, you know, I got my dry goods stocked up. I'm ready for the recession. I got oranges in the pantry. I got beans in the pantry. I got black eyed peas in the pantry. I got uh, army rations uh, in the pantry. I got hella bullets. So I'll be all right. Don't worry about me. Worry about what you're doing at your crib. Maybe get some good ass seeds and start planting them in the backyard. Learn the difference between uh, a winter vegetable and a summer vegetable. Get your season straight. Learn how to tell time without a clock, just looking at the positioning of the sun and the shadows, because all this shit is finna crumble. But this week, to help me uh, ease my existential pain is a good friend of mine. Uh, He also just moved out here to LA and he's killing it on his show. If you haven't checked it out, please check it out. It's called Therapy Gecko and it's on Twitch. Everybody please welcome Lyle, AKA Therapy Gecko. What's up, bruh? Hey, what's up, man? You know, it's um, I, in terms of helping you ease your existentialism. I this is an unpopular opinion, maybe, but I mm. I don't think it's that big of a deal that the Earth is dying because I think humanity had a pretty good run. You know, we, I mean, we were we, we did do it. We did do it though. It, it, no one can say we didn't put up numbers right like what else do we really have to prove that we need thousands more years to prove and i mean i guess that's my question you know what i mean if this is the final chapter of humanity is it that we were just supposed to be kind of a a a short you know three or four season anime or were we (laughs) supposed to really be naruto and were we supposed to like have where we're supposed to have a Dragon Ball Z amount of episodes. Do we already? I don't know if we do. No, I think, uh, and I'm about to get in the territory of talking about d- d- datical, I'm going to use the word datical things that I don't know the actual answers to, but I think, yeah. I think for all of the time that life has existed, humanity has been like a speck. So we have, we, we I think we're still in like, this is still one season. Yeah, we're still in season. That's what I'm saying. Like, like if we're going from if we're if we just start at life, not even starting at the universe, we just start at life, right? Humanity is like when uh, I'm trying to think of a TV show comparison. Humanity might as well be like the season of Curbed when JB Smoove moved in. Yeah with larry you know what i mean because they were they were pretty far into curb and then like they introduced this new thing and that's how i feel like we most of life was just larry david Mm -hmm. and and we're just now getting to see jb smooth become like this character and it might get nipped in the bud before we see it really play out we're a little bit like the office after michael left yeah, yeah we're in that season there you go and we're ending but you know this this is a can you still hear me on my phone locked i have absolutely no idea how okay there we go All right. yeah i can hear you perfect um this is how i feel about my own death is that if i you know i i like life i like being alive i mm-hmm. enjoy humanity and everything it has to offer but if tomorrow it all had to end I, I I feel like it would be greedy of me to be upset. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, that old, but, you know, I got to have some years. You know, I got to have more years than people who were never born. You know, I, here's my I just question. be grateful for the amount of time I got to have? Please, what's your question? My question is, it, it's off in the end tomorrow. Sure. Did you titty fuck? I titty fucked more than I ever thought I would in my life. Wow. Damn, yeah, I mean, that's my only thing. That's my only, I guess that's my only thing. I haven't done it. So, 
you know, hopefully before you, we all you've are like never, wait, 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 you've like, never you've never titty fucked someone before? Yeah, I don't really know how to get into that. Like, do you it, it feels like a thing that if you didn't do it when you were like 18, 19, I don't feel agile enough to be doing all that. Titty fucking it kind of feels like uh it kind of feels like skateboarding to me. Like if you didn't get into it when you were young, now you're too old to be trying to pull that one out. Uh, when I was, you know what? I totally see what you're saying. When I was like you hurt yourself. 14, 13, like when I first started like jacking off to porn, mm -hmm. um, I was so obsessed with it. I didn't, I didn't, I only watched a titty fucking porn. I had no interest in having like actual sex. Like the scenes where people were having sex, I, I, skipped over them just to watch the titty fucking scenes and now i'm not as into it because it doesn't it doesn't really make sense and i don't think it feels like like for the woman there's not really that much stimulation no. there i don't think no no woman is like oh man you was really fucking up my uh solar plexus <laughs> the other night like no nobody's like yeah get in my sternum like it ain't it ain't doing nothing for her, and that to me feels uh, that feels weird. That feels like the thing is off. Because if she started moaning and stuff, I'm like, well, what is you moaning at? Right. You know what I mean? Like it feels it feels ultra fake. Even when I watch it in the porn, I'm like, you're not moaning about nothing. He just he just he just riding up and down your chest. Ain't nothing going on. Oh, I guess she's doing it for your own sake to make you feel like you're doing something. Yeah, yeah. I guess that makes it kind of okay. I don't know. It, maybe it evens out. Man, I wish that um I wish I had something in my life that I was excited that I'm as excited about currently as I was when I was 14 and had never touched boobs before. Like I, like that's a level of excitement. I was like, you know, one day I'll be an adult and I'll I will have sexual experience and like i was looking forward to that and then and now that it's happened and you know i have had sex before and i know what it's like I, I, it's almost it's almost like when you know it's been a while since i've looked forward to like a new video game or a movie coming out or something i just haven't nothing in my life has given me as much um anticipation as that it's a yeah, little you know, everything feels a little bit gray yeah the, the the more you experience everything that, that's one thing i do feel very uh <clears throat> grateful for in my life is that uh growing up in abject poverty uh it like i had to experience everything kind of late you know what i mean yeah, from, like, yeah, yeah. from like driving a car really fast to mm -hmm. like you know uh all, just all types of shit. you know putting just one finger into a vagina like I, I did I, I got to everything kind of late that required some like you know some some funds or anything to do so uh I still feel like even at 30 I'm like I'm still kind of enjoying things like they're new mm. so I don't want everything to crumble right now because I feel like I'm gonna be my my funniest and my most like horniest and efficient when I'm like 40. Dude, didn't we talk remember when you were on my show didn't we talk about you met some guy who was like 50 or 60 or something and he was telling you he had the best yep. sex of his life and there was some root i might be making this part up but there was some root or some vitamin or something do you remember any of this yeah it was maca maca, maca. yeah yep i i got I, I just got one of my homegirls on maca she uh She's on SSRIs and it fucks with her libido. And I was like, you need to get on that maca. See if it helps. See if the maca just just starts revving that coochie up. It might, it might rev that coochie up. You never know. Now it don't work. It's a lot of people think maca is like a miracle thing. Like you for some people, you could take like I, I take maca and I'm pretty much within an hour, I'm like ready to go. Yeah. But it's like a long haul thing, man. You take that every every day. Shit. It, it could be fucking Mad Max by the time you're 60 years old. The world could be on its last leg, and you'll you'll still be out here fucking. 
So what do you what do you normally talk about with people on uh, on this show? Oh, this is it. We just talk about life. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really went right into it with the. Well, I feel like I feel like maybe you can we we can just dive straight in, but we okay. should we should loop back, and I do want to like kind of dig into to your life a little bit because I feel okay. like your show is very, you know, you 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 log on and people are immediately just throwing their life at you. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like it's a a, a great opportunity to kind of reverse it here and, and learn about Lyle and learn about like the inception of therapy gecko and just your story in general. Like where does the story of Lyle begin? Oh man. You know, it's uh, I think the reason why I like doing a show, I love doing a show that's not about me. That's about other people. And I think that's cause like ultimately my uh, story, I guess is not that interesting but like you know i i started um let's see man i started uh i started as a stand-up comedian when i was like 16 years old and so oh, wow. I, you were early yeah yeah and uh and that was kind of scary because like well uh, do you like in the open mic scene like everyone is a little bit like territorial and mm -hmm. sort of cold and whatnot and when you're 16 like it's way worse. Like nobody wants to talk to you. So I was like, I remember I was like driving around to dive bars and shit when I was like on a school night. I would be out until like one a.m. in the city uh, doing stand up, and then I would wake up at six and go to school the next morning. And I remember it felt really cool because like all the other kids were doing like fucking soccer or debate team or whatever, and my after school uh, activity was at one o'clock in the morning at this random bar in the outskirts of town. Uh, and I liked that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so I was doing stand up when I was really young. And then, um, I started, uh, do you, do you ever do stand up around Philadelphia? Yeah. I used to perform at a uh, good, good RIP. Yeah. RIP. Shout out to have you, dude, have you been to, um, I have had kind of, a fuck do you pronounce it? Elysian, El Elysian. Uh, Elysian in LA. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the run by the same uh, uh, by Kate. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was I was at the Elysian. Uh, I think maybe forty eight to seventy two hours ago. Oh no shit! My friend Jordan Temple has a has a one man play that he is working out, and he needed me to come and play his grandma's arthritis. You played a manifestation of his grandma's arthritis. That's exactly what I did, and it that's was, incredible. Uh, it was a it was a great time. So I, I'm, uh, if you're ever in LA, uh, anyone listening, hopefully in a in a few months there will be a, a a more updated and cleaner version of that play, Jordan Temple's play called Sweet Lorraine. But um, yeah. So you so you were doing open mics. You were doing the comedy grind at a super duper young age did you um did you know back then what you wanted to do with comedy or were you just kind of like well this feels like the correct direction uh i i, I knew i wanted to like do stand up and make movies mm -hmm. um and i'm so glad that i do what i do now instead of that because you can really spend a lot of time banging your fucking head against the wall alone in a dark room trying to write stuff. Yeah. And I like podcasting. I like doing stuff like, you know, fucking what we're doing now and, and uh, you know, doing Therapy Gecko because everything that's, like, funny or interesting about it is, like, done in the moment. Yeah. So it feels a little bit more real than, like, when you're – like, because when you're doing stand-up, you're, like, kind of sort of crafting every word or every beat of it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, even, I mean, even with stand up, like the, the parts of it that are like spontaneous, the audience, I think appreciates the most, you know, yeah. people like doing crowd work and, uh, uh, improv and, and shit like that. Um, so I just felt like it was, it, it got, it got the most, uh, 
you, you know, talking on a podcast got the most of my like feelings or raw expression and shit more than than doing stand up did. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also way easier. Stand-up, stand-up's, well, yeah, stand-up's yeah. fucking hard. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's incredibly hard <laughs> to fucking do stand-up. It is a, a yeah, man, and I feel like every it, it's it's like a double-edged sword. I feel like every time you bomb, it like it, it sharpens you, but it also is like, oh man, like <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, is this re- did I really just have fun just now, or or did I just walk over hot coals barefoot? You know? You um, know, I feel like I like I I remember when I I remember when my stand-up. Uh, like endeavor kind of ended is um i was at a showcase with one of my friends and bo- both of us weren't on the lineup and i said to him like man it kind of feels great to like just be at this show and not be on the lineup because i don't have to worry about anything and my friend was like what are you kidding me i'm, I'm dying to be up there of course i want to be on the lineup every time you were like Ugh, nigga you dying to be up there <laughs> yeah i was yeah exactly i was like dude uh, i was like all right if i am not feeling if i don't feel like that yeah then there's no point in me doing this that is 100 percent how i feel I, i've talked to people about stand-up and you know i think everybody has their own like perspective on it um and and how they view it but i definitely know people who are like no that is my lifeblood yeah i will you know <laughs> I, I live bleed sweat and eat to get on that stage and, and and get that time and I'm like, nigga, I don't feel that way about, <laughs> about <laughs> most things. <laughs> so uh damn good for you. But um no, I can always respect though when when someone I really respect when someone makes a decision to step back from it. You know what I mean? Or yeah, or just yeah. like have a better context about it because yeah. my context with stand up is different from everyone's, but I'm like, look, this is this is the calisthenics of being funny. And yeah, I think it's always going to be there, but if you are going to be dedicated and tried and true to the form, you need to like, there, there are samurais who are, who are just like, yeah. that is, they, that's what they live for. So don't, you know, so don't toy with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's another thing is you go and you see people who are like just fucking insanely good. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, you see people who are insanely good. And then you see people, and then I, I would like, I liked doing like kind of, I guess like an alt kind of comedy bullshit thing. Yeah. And I would see other people who I looked up to doing what I was trying to do better. So I was I also had this moment of like, well, fuck, these people do what I'm trying to do better. So what's the point of me even doing it? Like it's right there. It exists. I don't need to make it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but you know what's hard is that uh, all of my friends. It's like it's you're in a. It's like, it's like trying to learn how to make gumbo, but you live in Louisiana. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, dude, just <laughs> just go get it somewhere. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like I don't need to. Why do I need to learn how to make this thing yeah. that already exists in another another place? And, and but it's um. When you quit, it's hard because when you're in the stand-up scene, like that's your life. Like all of your friends mm-hmm. and all of your social time is with these people. And then when you decide to stop going to the mics, it's like, well, now you gave up your hobby and a little bit of your social life. You have to rebuild it. Yeah, yeah. So did you kind of reach that crossroads? And, you know, how were how you – recontextualizing that when you were decided to to leave from it were you because you obviously still had in your mind that comedy was the sphere you wanted to be in but it just wasn't yeah the right you know the right pathway but yeah what steps did you take after that was it just like and were you immediately like i gotta figure out this gecko idea like where where did the where did the train take you from there? I started, um, actually started producing. So oh, I okay. did like, uh, uh, I, I rented an apartment with a giant basement and, uh, my friends and I would put on these extremely illegal, uh, like DIY basement shows. And we would like 
run a bar and shit and uh it was it was pretty awesome it's funny because i um i heard like after after i'd stopped doing that i like saw a news report of like a philadelphia speakeasy that mm-hmm. got uh busted down and a bunch of people who were like sentenced to jail time and i was like oh fuck that could have fucking been me but it wasn't you dodged a fucking bullet yeah yeah, yeah. but um i started doing that and that was awesome um I did that for a while, uh, and then my landlord saw like an Instagram ad that I was running, mm-hmm. and she was like, "Is that my fucking house?" <laughs> and you're like, "No," and I was like, uh... "And so she kicked us out." And then right after that, um, I started. Uh, I went to go work at Adult Swim right after that went mm-hmm. down and what uh, were you doing at what were you doing at swim uh i was on their like social media team so i was like making uh like memes of rick and morty and shit. it was a pretty millennial job right right but do you think like being in the swim like that kind of environment was inspiring for you or was it just more like you know did you just feel like paper pencil pushing like it was just whatever to 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 make a check or were you like gaining some sort of uh some sort of inspiration to like make your next move uh it was it was it was awesome uh, i i've been wanting to work there since i was like 14 um same, same. and and it kind of it kind of because i was i was doing like uh, i was cutting clips and stuff but then i was also i wrote a couple of, of bumps and I did a couple of like, uh, like sort of social media type of bump gag things, and it kind of got me back in the rhythm of like writing stuff and creating stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing that for a bit, and then the pandemic happens. Uh, I went back from Atlanta to my mom's house in Baltimore, and uh, from there is where I started doing therapy gecko um tell me about the day because in my mind lyle becoming therapy gecko it feels like there was a a radioactive spider bite moment (laughs) And, and and you know of course not like literally that but what sparked the idea you know there's there's so much mystique and if there if there's too much that you don't want to give away of course oh, like, but it, i would love to know what was happening in life what were the uh what was the sugar spice and everything nice plus the chemical x to make therapy gecko a reality there's like five the truth is there's like five different things that all kind of mash together in a sugar spice everything nice way Mm-hmm. Um, man, one is that like just as a thing because we like at the pandemic we we're all bored and trying to find ways to connect and do shit with our time. And uh, I was going on, I was just going live on Instagram a lot mm-hmm. and talking to like the ten people that followed me at the time. And I remember kind of thinking like, oh, I'm having fun just being a streamer, and it would be cool to see if I could do this. For people who aren't just like people I went to high school with, right? So it's kind of a, a germ in my uh, in my head, and um, and then I discovered the Reddit public access network, and the Reddit public access network is the, is ultimately the reason why I'm talking to you and why any of this worked out. Really? Um, yeah. Do you do you know anything about the Reddit public access network? Very little. Can you you got to run me through it? It's well, you know Reddit. Yeah. Um, Reddit has this. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they have this streaming service called RPAN, Reddit Public oh. Access Network, and it was basically just a, a lot of people like playing guitar and just chatting and. You know what? I think I do know what you're talking about. Was this where some of those early Mark Rebier clips were coming from? Yeah, Mark is also a, uh, uh, I believe he's an alumni of 
Got it. Uh, R pan. I think he was using it. A lot of it was like for musicians. And so mm -hmm. if you were to do anything that wasn't music, you would stand out a little bit more. So I just started like I didn't even take calls. I just put on the gecko costume and went live and like fucking went on a rant about eating bugs and the reptilian agenda and like just stupid <laughs> bullshit. And um and then I started taking calls and I think at the beginning my intention was like a little bit more so to fuck with people who called me. Uh-huh. Um and then you ever heard okay, you know how people get um you ever heard of people talking about how they get like trapped in a loop of irony? Yes, yes. Like there's too many layers of irony that you yeah. are just in a, in a poisonous gas cloud of yeah of inside jokes. So I got, I think the opposite happened to me. I think I got accidentally trapped in a loop of sincerity. Ah, I'm still in wow. because because I started out. I think what happened. I started out thinking I was gonna fuck with people. And then people started, to, and then I didn't expect this, but people just started being like very genuine toward me, and just being and honest it, with you. And yeah, yeah, they were being very genuine, very honest, and it caught me off guard. And so I started responding very genuinely and very honest, and uh, that kind of got me into that that loop of sincerity. <laughs> wow, that's a. a that's a beautiful loop to get pushed into <laughs> Like That's just like, you know what I mean? Like you, you kind of, I bet you kind of felt like you were jumping into a pool of sharks, but then you just kind of end up in like the shallow end of a, of a nice pool. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. just kind of like floating there, you know, and, uh, people aren't being dickheads. And I, I feel like the, the psychology of that is like, was so interesting to me, like, cause people go live every day and, you know, show their faces and try to do some version of everything. Uh, but sometimes the version of what you're doing and don't get the same response. So what, what do you feel it is about your, your alias and, and, and the gecko that like subdues people's urge to be, to just like unleash on you with anger, but you know what I mean? Like what yeah, is, yeah. I think there's a couple things. I think, um, I like when people at the beginning, when they would try to troll me or like fuck with me or get me angry, I would just go along with it and mm -hmm. not give them that reaction. And I think people kind of understood that like they weren't going to get to me. Mm -hmm. And so they, and then the people watching kind of saw that I was going to be genuine to people who called in. And I think that that empowered them to call in more genuinely. Cause I, I, I think that, you know, you know how I came into it thinking I was going to fuck with people. I think people watching it also thought, Oh, this guy's has, He's not here trolling. To, is here to yeah. fuck with people here to troll. And sometimes I am a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but I think that they see me kind of take people at face value and they're like, oh, okay, there's nothing I could call this guy with where he's not going to take me, you know, get into it with me. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that people were receptive to that. And dude, it was so surprising because I totally thought, and, and not to say that this doesn't happen, but I totally thought that when I put a phone number on the internet that like 90% of it was just going to be people like, just Nazis calling, calling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just calling in, yelling a slur, hanging up, and then like, you know, just shit like that. And like that did happen a couple times, but right. overwhelmingly, the majority of people like called in like with shit to say, which was was and still is very wild to me. Huh? It, it, like, what I think what interests me the most about the community that you've created around therapy gecko is that like. Uh, it is kind of in a way like cutting through a lot of misconceptions that I and that you had apparently hmm. and a lot of misconceptions that get kind of like built into people's audiences yeah. from how they treat their audiences, if that makes sense. And like yeah. you're in this feedback loop of sincerity, but one could say, you know, Rogan's fan base is in this feedback of 
pompous, you know, uh, gloating and, and, you know, uh, you know, hyper masculinity and trying to, you know, over intellectualize themselves. There's, there's kind of like a, there's an ethos in every single audience. And I've been just like really interested in that. And I, I wonder how you feel about building that and how you, do you feel like you now have this like thing that you have to usher and be more, more careful with, or do you feel more free because of it? Dude, I, I think about this a lot. I, I, like the the baseline question of to what degree is a creator responsible or the cause of right how their fan base acts mm-hmm. um that i don't have like i'm still uh, that question is still a work in progress to me i think um you know what i don't what i don't like and what i try not to do i mean i do it anyway but is like telling my audience like how they should act or how they should be. Right. I'm more so just like, okay, I'm gonna take an open-minded approach to the people who call me, um, and I'm gonna act, you know, with respect towards the people who call me, and hopefully people will just like see that as an example, and I don't have to like, you know, I I, I never want to get like preachy to my audience about how they should like be or act because you know they're their own people and I'm not you know, here to tell anyone how to live their life. I'm just here to be a gecko and talk to people on the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, I've gotten very lucky. I've had people tell me uh, like, oh yeah, like Twitch is typically filled with a lot of toxicity, but. Yeah, it's, means, just, you know, it's just fuck shit. Like a, it's yeah. like a <laughs> constant train of fuck shit on Twitch. And uh, yeah, to see something be that, you know, pure, is a uh it's a it's like a big you know relief you know what i mean especially in a time like this when i do think that the vast majority of people are not bad i don't think that the vast majority of people on the internet are are you know mad just like (laughs) racist idiots i think those people are out there and they're out there like heavily but um yeah, I think the majority of people just want somebody to talk to. And I think that the the beautiful thing about your show is that it captures the number one way to make good friends and lifelong uh, relationships that, that are healthy and that, that work are to listen more than you fucking talk. Totally. And uh, when you speak and when you talk, just try to connect the other person's story <laughs> to yours and and don't, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like, especially living in LA, everyone's conversation is, well, I and I and I and I, and yeah. then they go, and what are you up to? And I think we're all guilty of that. I'm guilty of it too, but Therapy Gecko is not guilty of that. Maybe Lyle is, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, do I totally know what you're saying, like, there's definitely, and I don't even think that what you're, de- everyone knows what you're talking about and what you're describing. I don't even think it comes from like an a, a, an, in, an intentionally pompous place or anything when people do that. I think that that like, that's just people's way of like relating to other people, you know, mm-hmm. like when they, when they sort of are always talking about themselves, cause that's, I guess how they are trying to relate to others. Um, I like I said at the beginning, I, I, I like uh, talking to other people about their lives because I don't think I inherently have like a super interesting, you know, crazy uh, background or, or a story or anything like that. And um, I'm also, I, dude, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm sick of myself. Like I'm myself all the time. I'm in my oh. own fucking brain all the time. I'm in my own issues all the time. And honestly, the three hours that I get to be a gecko and talk to other people, I like I get to leave a lot of myself and my bullshit behind and get into other people's shit. And that's therapeutic for me. Yeah, man. No, I feel you. Like it ain't even like a, a it, it's not even like a like I, I love, you know, my life. I love my girl. I love my dog. I like where I live. You know what I mean? I, I like 
pretty much everything. But yeah, some days I wake up and I'm like, why can't I be Georgia Smith? Like, <laughs> why can't I be a bad bitch with a British accent who can kind of sing? Like, that's all I want. Just, just not even every day, just like, I think Fridays and Sundays, I would love to be a bad bitch. Dude, and buy just, a wig. You should do it. Do you think I should just do it? I think you should just do it. I feel like there's no, you know, I'd may, maybe put on a, put it on a schedule with your, with your, with your wife, or with your girl. Wait, is she your wife or your girlfriend? She's my fiance now. Yeah. Oh, when did that happen? That happened like right after I met you. I think I was like, I, I was, I was like, man, that gecko changed my life. I need to, uh, <laughs> I need to seal this shit in. <laughs> yeah, Mazel Tov, man. How does that feel? It feels good, man. It, it doesn't. Uh, it feels the best because it doesn't feel like it was this uh, contrived or like it, it wasn't a decision made an impulse. It was a decision that was made a while ago that I was just, you know, you just kind of like walk up to it together and you're like, okay, yeah, it's time to lock this shit in now. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's what I'm looking for in most life decisions, but most of them aren't that easy. <laughs> most life decisions are not as easy as uh, two people just agreeing to be like, "Yeah, let's let's fucking get married." It's like, did you did you always want to get married? Like even when you were when you were young? Um, no, no. I think when I was young, I thought I would grow up and be a Power Ranger or like Mr. T or um, drive monster trucks. Like I, I never. I never really thought of uh, of of marriage as a as a cool thing as a kid. What kid thinks of marriage as cool? I wanted to I wanted the titty fuck mm -hmm. and uh and have like I wanted to have uh, eight PSPs when I was fourteen. That was like the height of my dreams is just having a a PSP in every different color. Like I didn't I was not thinking about love and shit were you were you thinking about so, so tell me so once you're married are you like a saving titty fucking for marriage kind of person is that when it'll finally go down i think the night of my wedding I, i'm a titty fuck for sure okay titty fuck for sure on the night of my wedding but yeah i i feel like i want the 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 titty fuck to be done to me i don't want to i don't want to do the titty fuck i want it to be done upon me when you say that, do you you don't mean you want someone to fuck your titties. You mean you want the your fiance to do the you wrap her tits around your dick as opposed to you taking your dick and putting it in between her tits. You want her to do the work. Oh no, that's I mean that sounds beautiful, but I would love to also be titty fucked. I think like oh. I think if it's useless. If it's a useless sexual gesture, let's why not just do it in both directions? Why don't you bobsled on my chest? You know how there are guys who get their ribs removed to suck their own dick? What yeah. bones do you get removed to titty fuck yourself? Wow, I think like uh vertebrae's number four through like eight in uh and and then don't put anything in the spine after that. You just let your body kind of fold like a lawn chair. I feel like titty fucking yourself. You know, I've never, I've never tried because I've uh, everyone's tried to suck their own dick. I know I can't do that, but I'm actually think tried to titty. Now, I'm kind of bending over right now, and if I did have a hard on, mm -hmm. I would be able to slip it in between. Oh, I'm gonna try this right now. Uh, no, it's not gonna work for me. No, just kind of, are you sitting down? Are you? Sitting I'm, down? I'm I'm currently prone. Oh wait, hold on. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm um. If I I I can't. I can't, I'm looking right now, and I can't tell if this would be easier if I were skinnier or fatter. Because if I were fatter, I would have bigger tits, and it, I would mm. be... But right now, my stomach is cock-blocking me from my own tits. See, and that's that's where, yeah, see, because I, I had a little bit of a gut, but now I've been I've been vegan for like a month. You've been vegan for a month? I've been vegan. I ain't been drinking for like a month. So I think yes. I could titty fuck myself just off the, like that, it's that water weight. Once you get rid of that water weight, then you can really do whatever. Does that feel good being vegan or is it awful? Um, It's a little bit of both, man. I'm from, uh, I'm from Georgia and you lived in Atlanta for a long time. So you can attest to this. Uh, food is the best when it kills you by the time you're 50. 
that's just the way life works. Yeah. The best food in the world does not allow you to to live to see <laughs> old age. You know what I mean? Like the be- the best food and you're eating it constantly. So and that's the kind of food that I love and I love uh drinking, I love beer, I love making cocktails, I love all that shit, but you know, the moment you kind of put it down, your brain feels like, you know, just clear and, and open and you can make, I, I, here's my thing. Like Please. I'm a hedonist, but I have to, at this point, treat my body like it's a 1996 Toyota Camry. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that bitch hit a deer one time, the fabric on the roof part is hanging down. I've had to change tail lights most multiple times. Like this shit, it, it, if I'm going to get from A to B, I got to make sure every single thing in this car is running correct. Right. So uh, that, that was a big part of the decision, at least for a while. And then I'll go back to just, you know, shoving uh, steak sandwiches in the gas tank of the Toyota Camry and hoping that it keeps working. What's your, what's your worst vice? Like the thing you just can't give up. I think it's like, I think it would have to be uh, my worst vice. I don't want to say alcohol. That's so lame. No, I, I, well, we, we want the truth. You don't have to think of something cool. Yeah, but it's so lame. Like alcohol is, and it's not also not my biggest, I think my biggest vice is Nashville hot fried chicken. Nashville hot fried chicken. And, um, fuck, what's the name of this chicken place in Atlanta that I had a bunch of times? Hattie B's. Uh, is it Hattie B's? Is, it, is that a chain? Uh, uh, some chain. I'm not going to remember the name. Was of it. it American Deli? Ah, oh, fuck you, man. I shouldn't have even brought it up. I don't know the name. But, uh, what was it? What was it? Wings or was it? It was wings. Yeah, it was wings. You probably had American Deli. Okay, maybe it was American Deli, but in Atlanta, they got some fucking bomb fried chicken. Spicy man. chicken. Man, man, oh man. I can't even, uh, I can't even tell you. But, it, and, and, but surprisingly, all the women still beautiful in the South with, with just terrible diets. And that's why I think the South is such a magical place is that like, you'll, you'll meet, you'll meet a chick who eats like the little kid off Big Daddy, yeah. the Adam Sandler movie. Like she just eats like hot Cheetos and Sour Patch gummy worms and wings from American Deli, but she has like perfect skin and uh, and, and her pussy smells like honeydew. You know what I mean? You're like, how? Some people just have this like, I don't know what that is. Slot armor to their bodies where they can eat whatever they want and it doesn't affect them at yeah. all. At least on the outside. Maybe then their insides, there's something going on. something's being done, like heavy damage. But, did, I mean, did you feel that way in the South that, like, were, were you just kind of, like, going crazy and eating whatever the fuck? Uh, yeah, okay, this is this might be a controversial opinion, but okay. I, I, I'm <laughs> – all right, this, this might sound stupid. I'm not a big, like – I think location-based – food things like saying like oh maryland has the best crab oh speak on they have that. great uh, mexican food in texas oh they have great chicken and uh, like all that kind of, here's here's the truth here's the truth you can get in america any kind of food in any state yeah ultimately like like the like oh the great mexican food that they have in texas like at my hometown of baltimore maryland they have a Mexican restaurant, they serve delicious tacos and burritos. I'm not saying that – I just feel like you can get any food anywhere. So when whenever true. people are like, oh, the, the this and that place think, is so great, I'm like, ah, they have I it. Think what you're saying is that once some region claims to have the patented best style of a food, yeah, that, that to me is kind of the moment that it starts going downhill. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, like, uh, you know, how they have they have the Philly cheese steak in every fucking state, and when you go to Philly and you get a cheese steak, it tastes the same as if you get a cheese steak in Maryland. But I do wonder, to your point, back when it was just a cheese steak that happened to be in Philadelphia before Philly claimed it as their own, was it better? I I feel like there's there's ones where it's like. 
yes, y'all got it. And there's ones where it's like, come on, guys, you got to give it up. I think Philly, I'm not too sure about because I haven't had too many cheesesteaks. But I know for a fact, Buffalo, sorry, y'all's wings, put them shits in a mass grave. Get rid of all your wings and Buffalo. Them was the worst wings I ever had. Louisiana, every, I think every food that Louisiana claims to have the patent on, I believe them 100%. I'm not going to eat gumbo in Iowa. I'm not going to do it. You know what I mean? I'm not going to eat fucking jambalaya when I know that it came from, you know, South Carolina and Georgia. I'm not going to eat jambalaya in Utah. Matter of fact, I wouldn't eat a slice of white fucking bread in Utah because fuck that whole state. But what don't, what don't just, you like about Utah? You said what? What don't you like about Utah? Just everything. Just everything. Everything but the nature, I think. Just like, I think, you know, when window washers go and they just kind of like get all of the nasty shit off the window. I think yeah. Utah, Utah needs one of those. Mm. Um, Do you, are you an outside guy? You go outside a lot? Yeah, bro. I'd be hiking. I'd be in the rivers. Do you go outside? Uh, I'm trying to go outside more, but I don't go outside as much as I want to. What type of outside are you trying to do, though? Uh, I my I think my favorite recreational activity of all time is getting stoned and going for a walk. Okay, okay. Do you? But you? Do you want to just extend that nugget of activity to like? Okay, now you're stoned and you're in you're in the mountains. Now you're stoned and you're in the forest. I like um, you know, I kind of I kind of like the city. In a weird, I know this is not really getting outside, but like I like when there's exciting stimulus all around me to 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 gaze upon and think about. But uh, you know, I can also fuck with the mountains. You yeah. know, I like going up to big hills and uh, looking at rocks. Oh, you know what I love the most is a river that has a bunch of rocks sticking out of it, and you can kind of hop, hop across the, rock. the rocks. Yes, bro. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a gecko. <laughs> Yeah, bro. Rivers with rocks is like, man, I, I love feeling like a, a, sometimes I just like feeling like a, a, a character in a Mark Twain book, minus the, the, the N word on every page. But like, you know what I mean? Like you, you just read like a nice little nature book, Mark Twain shit. And you're like, yeah, man, they was just living life, man. Just living that simple life, skipping rocks on the, on the lake and, you know, uh, shoot a raccoon with a with a slingshot but not hard enough to kill it type shit zach what do you do all day <laughs> fantastic question <laughs> what do i do all day uh well most days i wake up i uh i read a little bit i um i usually what i'm reading causes me to start having deep, deep anxiety and existential pain by like a what, what are you what are you what are you reading? Hold on. Why we're, we're gonna get into a whole tangent. I want to hear the rest of your day, but real quick, what are you reading? Uh right now I'm reading this uh this Graber book still. I'm like trudging through it. I, I keep like putting it down because it's giving me too much stress. But uh Dawn of Everything by by David Graber. Okay. Uh, is there like a, is there like an existential thesis to it? Yeah, I mean, it's just like it's just like all everything of everything that we have been taught is incorrect, and it's like cited well. It's like not like one of those kind of books. Like it's not a conspiracy book. It's like here's well cited sources that all anthropological, you know, thought that we have been taught in America and in the West is completely wrong, and here's why. So that gives you a little bit that that doesn't boost my day at all. Um, <laughs> and then so, uh, so you, you start every day with uh, an existential breakdown at the hands of this book. Yeah. What do you do after you're done reading? Yeah, it's like uh, then I go from there and go immediately to just trying to play like the most violent video game I can. Um, usually like a GTA Five, like or or like or or fucking Halo or some shit like just a palate cleanser of like. Here's what most of my day is. It's oscillating between like trying to educate myself and then my brain 
breaks down somewhere in there from my ADHD. And then I just go immediately to the opposite spectrum Mm -hmm. and start filling my brain with just dumb shit. That's how you get to a nice, solid middle ground, though. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Play in the play playground of both extremes. Yeah, yeah. What do you, wait, what do you, how do you start your day? How do I start my day? Oh, God, I don't know if, uh, let's see. I usually, um, I wake up and I feel like I'm about to die. Like, I feel like I'm about to have a heart attack. Yeah, uh, bro, I be having that. <laughs> bro, I wake up and, like, my chest feels tight and I'm like, I need to make some fucking, I need to go vegan like Zach and start. Stop drinking and like, I needed to go vegan, you know, three years ago to reverse whatever's Bro, going on. Bro, the moment I stopped stop. drinking, I was waking up and my mouth would be so pause this, but my mouth is so wet now when I wake up. Like, drinking was stripping every drop of wet out of my body, and and now that I'm not, bro, I'd be waking up with us with just a sopping mouth so i just gotta say that for all my drinkers out there pause that up but a hey, wet mouth in the morning is very different i forgot i feel like i'm seven years old again what is um what has it done to your your titties has it uh made them any more any more luscious what not drinking yeah not drinking yeah my titties more cut up now they more like they, my titties michelangelo up like <laughs> like greek greek sculpted type shit whereas before it was kind of just like uh like john henry like like i looked like a steel driving man a few months ago and uh and now i'm you know i'm on my like you know i'm on my shriveled penis sculpture vibes like getting real sculpted you know Morning is existential dread the uh afternoon is violent video games what do you do at night do you do you do stand up or like go do fucking uh, 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 shows or anything like that? I'm a uh, I just watch hella movies, man. I watch a lot of like TV shows and movies throughout the day. I, I try to watch like I try to watch a movie. I feel like my whole day is trying to consume media that is uh, not hidden because nothing's like hidden in a way, but it's like there's this massive pile of things that are very good from like (laughs) from every decade and the current uh the current you know massive river of new shit keeps like pushing that stuff further and further into the sediment yes And, and i am very much the ethos of my day is what can i dig out of the sediment of media, whether it be music, whether it be video games. I was just going through like the old vault of like PS2 games and uh, Ooh, Sega which, Genesis which games. games talking here? You said what? Which PS2 games are we talking here? I'm talking like War of the Monsters. You remember that shit? No. Oh, you know, I saw you post something on your uh, story. Was that the game? Yeah, it was War of the Monsters. That was a that was a big one for me. Do you ever play my big game on the PS2 was Kingdom Hearts. Do you ever play that? Oh, of course. I feel like Kingdom Hearts, and maybe, and and I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I feel like Kingdom Hearts. I'm trying to find a word for it. <laughs> I feel like Kingdom Hearts, like low key. This gonna sound like some no. I'm I'm with you. Funny bit shit, but like I feel like that game ushered me into like adolescence and like like taught me a lot of lessons about uh about the world not literally but just through like how that game is structured and the plot of it is very like coming of age it, i mean it is a story about adolescence this little kid living on this island he doesn't you know think that the world is bigger than this and yes that, that is immediately shattered you know what i mean and like all these themes were perfect. They like I, I really uh I don't envy um kids that are growing up right now in this video game kind of like landscape because my generation got hit perfectly. I think I was like 10 or 11 when Kingdom Hearts came out and it just like it kind of changed my life. 